Yeah. Uh, Oops, make... It's Kate here. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Kate, is that coming through loud and clear? Dr. Alejandro, I can see you talking, but I don't hear you, unfortunately. Yeah. No. Kate, I'm going to mute you again. Welcome back, Dr. Alejandro. Let's see if your sound works now. There we go, that sounds better. Dr. Alejandro, I can hear something from you, I think, now. Annalise, do you have the text of Alejandro's statement? I'm not seeing it in the email. The revised text. Just, okay, just to remind you that there's 199 participants on this call already. Dr. Alejandro, I think we can hear you. Oh, no, he's gone.
Hello. Hello, Dr. Craviotto. I see you. I hear you now, and now I see you. It's working perfectly. Oh. <laughs> Sorry for all I the problems. Was, uh, good. Okay. Thank you so I much. Think we're good. I'm going to mute you now, sir, but you can unmute yourself when you need to, okay? Yeah, yeah, that's right.
Hello all, um, this is Fadila Shaib speaking to you from WHO headquarters in Geneva and welcoming you to our global COVID-19 press conference today, Tuesday 5th uh, January, our first press briefing of 2021. I'm sorry for the delay uh, and thank you for your uh, patience. Uh, the focus today will be on COVID-19, but we will also brief you on the outcome of today's virtual meeting of SAGE the strategic advisory group of uh, experts on immunization. Um, we will be joined by a special guest, the SAID chair that Dr. Tedros will introduce. Present in the room are WHO Director General Dr. Tedros, Dr. Mike Ryan, Executive Director Health Emergencies, Dr. Maria von Kerkhoff, Technical Lead on COVID-19, Dr. Bruce Elward, Special Advisor to DG and Lead on ACT Accelerator. Dr. Mariangela Shimao, Assistant Director General Access to Medicines and Health Products. Steve Solomon, Principal Legal Officer. Dr. Uh, Joachim Hombach, uh, SAGE Secretariat. Joining us remotely are Dr. Sumia Swaminathan, Chief Scientist. Dr. Kate O'Brien, Director, Immunization, Vaccines, and Biological. Welcome all. Simultaneous interpretation is provided in the six UN languages, plus Portuguese and Hindi. And now, without further ado, I will hand over to Dr. Tedros for his opening remarks. Dr. Tedros, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Ferdila. Good morning. Good afternoon and good evening. Wherever you are, I wish you a happy new year. In our first briefing of 2021, I want to take a quick step back and tell you what's going to be coming up in the next few weeks. The pandemic is still a major public health crisis. We're in a race to save lives, livelihoods, and end this pandemic, and I will share more on that shortly. However, WHO is not just fighting the pandemic. We're fighting numerous disease outbreaks across the world, picking up and analyzing hundreds of potential signals every week. And our work goes far beyond emergencies. We work to improve human health in all its aspects from birth to old age. As shown in the past year, WHO is working day and night to accelerate science, provide solutions to challenges on the ground, and build global solidarity. This is, an important, this is as important for tackling the pandemic as it is for getting essential services back up and running again. From preventing mothers and their children dying in childbirth to tackling silent emergencies like antimicrobial resistance and mental health, to the prevention, screening, and control of HIV, TB, malaria, and neglected tropical diseases. This month, for example, is Cervical Cancer Awareness Month, where WHO is working with partners around the world to accelerate the first global health strategy for the elimination of a cancer. We have learned a lot in the last year, not least that health is an investment in overall development critical for thriving economies and a key pillar of national security. Health cannot be an afterthought when we have an emergency. We must ensure truly integrated primary healthcare systems that effectively prevent, screen, and treat infectious diseases and non-communicable diseases like diabetes, cancer, and heart and lung diseases. The latter collectively lead to the death of more than 40 million people every year. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown us once again how a new infectious virus puts those with underlying conditions at highest risk of dying. And those countries that have high numbers of people with health conditions put extra stress on the health system. And we must work with those focused on the climate crisis, which directly impacts health. Ultimately, 
we need to invest in preparedness and surveillance to stop the next pandemic and ensure that everyone has access to quality health services. In the year ahead, scientists and public health experts from inside and outside WHO will continue to work with us to break down the latest science and innovations and putting forward solutions so that we can build back greener and stronger health systems. My one hope is that there is less politicking about health in the year ahead. We have entered a new phase of the pandemic where solidarity is needed like never before. We are in a race to save lives right now. And as my colleague, Dr. Mike Ryan said back in March last year, it's important in any crisis to act fast and have no regrets. Case loads are so high in several countries that hospitals and intensive care units are filling up to dangerous levels. For some countries, during the recent holiday period and cold weather, people mixed indoors more, which we know is riskier and will have consequences. New variants, which appear to be more transmissible, are exacerbating the situation. We call on all countries to increase testing and sequencing of the virus so that we can monitor and respond effectively to any changes. Ultimately, countries have to consider their epidemiological situation and take appropriate measures based on the data. It's a tough balancing act, but ultimately saving lives, protecting health workers, and health systems must come first. I know it's tiring, but it's many times worse for those working or being treated in an overcrowded hospital or for people who have had their cancer treatment postponed. So we must act for the most vulnerable that need help right now, as well as minimizing contacts in this critical period Governments must support people who have to isolate or quarantine. Just as governments have generated stimulus to keep economies going, it's important to find innovative ways to offer people the chance to isolate safely away from others. To break chains of transformation, to break chains of transmission, we must identify and find those who are infected provide the care they need and help them truly isolate safely. We are in a race to prevent infections, bring cases down, protect health systems and save lives while rolling out highly effective and safe vaccines to high-risk populations. This is not easy. These are the hard miles we must tread together. But if we act together, we can win both races and get ahead of the virus while also limiting the opportunity for the virus to mutate further and threaten the health tools we currently have. Last week, WHO issued its first emergency use listing for a COVID-19 vaccine the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. And yesterday, it was also encouraging to see the AstraZeneca vaccine rollout begin in the first country. One year on from WHO issuing its first disease outbreak news report about this virus, more than 30 countries have started vaccinating their high-risk populations with various COVID-19 vaccines. The scientific community has set a new standard for vaccine development. Now, the international community must set a new standard for access. COVAX has been backed by 190 countries and economies, and I want to see all manufacturers channel supply to COVAX quickly so that rollouts can begin and those at high risk are protected around the world. We owe it morally to health workers everywhere who have been fighting this pandemic around the clock for the best part of a year to vaccinate them all as soon as possible. 
People must come first over short-term profits. It's in countries' self-interest to shun vaccine nationalism. Vaccinating health workers and those at high risk of serious disease is the fastest way to stabilize health systems, ensure all essential health services are up and running, and that a truly global economic recovery can take place. I urge all governments to work together and live up to their commitments to equitable distribution globally, and all pharmaceutical groups to boost supply as quickly as possible and to fully participate in COVAX. The 100-100 initiative driven by WHO, UNICEF, and the World Bank is supporting over 100 countries to conduct rapid readiness assessment and develop country-specific plans for vaccines and other COVID-19 tools. So far, more than 90 countries have already completed the assessments, and our teams are working around the clock to ensure that governments and health systems are ready for global vaccine rollout, but we need consistent, predictable, affordable supply of safe and effective vaccines. Morally, economically, socially, and for global security, we must act together right now to ensure equitable rollout. Following the emergency use listing last week, the SAGE group met today to discuss policy recommendations for the use of the Pfizer vaccine. I would like to invite the chair of SAGE, Dr. Alejandro Cravioto, to tell us about the recommendations. The floor is yours, Alejandro. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Director General, and a Happy New Year to you, too. Um, the Strategic Advisory Group of Experts on Immunization uh, was established by the Director General in 1999, and it's comprised of 15 experts from around the world uh, charged with providing independent advice to the WHO DG on all policy-related issues of vaccines and immunization. The group is very well balanced geographically and gender-wise. Uh, in June of last year, as, as we do with other vaccines, SAGE set up a working group for the COVID-19 vaccines that were being developed. The group consists of 26 experts from around the world in all different areas and have consistently been working for the past uh, months at least two, three times a week to be able to help us develop a number of documents and issues that we have been reviewing at SAGE level. The first uh, product of the working group was a values framework for allocation and prioritization, which was uh, uh, presented to the DG and approved in September of 2020, and then a roadmap of prioritization for the group that should be set up for vaccination, which was also approved and disseminated in October of 2020. These documents have been translated to all the UN official languages, or the, the WHO official languages. And today we met to look into the approval of the WHO emergency use listing of the Pfizer-BioNTech mRNA COVID-19 vaccine. The uh, meeting uh, was uh, initiated by uh, with a review of the current situation of the uh, COVID vaccine development pipeline, and of course, the issues related to these SARS-CoV-2 virus, virus variants, which is something that is worrying everyone. Uh, we looked at the global, regional, and country-level plans for COVID vaccine uh, safety monitoring, and we looked at the safety and efficacy data uh, from phase one to three clinical trials of the Pfizer-BioNTech mRNA COVID-19 vaccines, BNT162B2. This was presented by the Pfizer and the BioNTech experts and uh, was discussed by the SAGE members and the members uh, also participating in the session. We deliberated and came back, uh, came out with the following recommendations. 
Uh, SAGE recommends the administration of two doses of this vaccine within 21 to 28 days. Uh, while we acknowledge the absence of data on safety and efficacy after one dose beyond the three, four weeks studied in the clinical trials, SAGE made a provision for countries in exceptional circumstances of vaccine supply constraints and epidemiologic settings to delay the administration of the second dose for a few weeks in order to maximize the number of individuals benefiting from a first dose. In the case of the anaphylactic reactions after administration of the Pfizer vaccine that have been reported outside of the clinical trials, SAGE recommended that the vaccine should be administered only in settings where anaphylaxis can be treated. So we provided a specific narrow exclusion for vaccination and on the observation period, as well as the management, monitoring, and reporting on, of any safety events. We recognize the importance of vaccination of pregnant women, especially given the priority for protection of health workers, of whom a large proportion globally are, of course, women. Nevertheless, uh, in light of the data limitation, SAGE was not able to provide a recommendation for the use of the vaccine in pregnancy until more safety data are available. However, we made a provision for situations where a benefit of vaccination of a pregnant woman outweighs the potential risks, such as health workers at high risk of exposure. We have done this before for other vaccines as the use of the Ebola vaccine in, in the Democratic Republic of Congo before. SAGE acknowledged the lack of data for uh, recommending the vaccine to lactate in women. And given the importance of breastfeeding, we uh, encourage the companies to be able, or the company to be able to bring information necessary for us to make a decision in the near future. As with the case of the pregnant women, we have also made a provision in which uh, if a woman is part of a high-risk group, then we recommend the vaccination without the stopping of the breastfeeding. In the case of uh, persons, uh, in the case of uh, persons, sorry. SAGE recommends that COVID vaccination be offered regardless of a person's history of asymptomatic or symptomatic SARS-CoV-2 infection. Available data currently indicate that symptomatic reinfection within six months after an initial infection is rare. Thus, in the context of limited vaccine supply, Persons with a PCR documented SARS CoV 2 infection in the preceding six months may choose to delay vaccination until near end of this time period. This would encourage the use of the vaccines for other people who have not been exposed to the virus and thus have a much larger portion of the population protected. As noted in the prioritization roadmap, SAGE re-emphasized that national programs should take specific steps to identify groups that are proportionally affected by COVID-19 and those who face health inequities due to social structural inequities in order to address barriers to vaccination and achieve equitable access to the products. In the current period of very limited supply, preferential vaccination of international travels would counter the principle of equity. Because of this and the lack of evidence to inform whether vaccination reduces the risk of transmission, SAGE currently does not recommend COVID-19 vaccination of travelers unless they are also part of a high-risk group identified within the prioritization roadmap. SAGE recommends the continued post-authorization monitoring of COVID-19 vaccines for effectiveness and safety, and listed multiple specific areas of additional research on COVID-19 vaccines, such as vaccine efficacy, 
against SARS-CoV transmission, duration of protection, vaccine efficacy against the virus variants, vaccine efficacy and safety in children younger than 16 years old, immunogenicity and safety, and especially co-transmission with other vaccines and vaccine interchangeability. This is important, especially with the co-administration for the elderly group with, a, with, a, with an influenza vaccine, if that were possible. In the coming weeks and months, we will continue to review the other vaccines as they become available. And uh, the, with the data coming from the manufacturers when made available for these deliberations and as part of the regulatory processes are undertaken. The recommendations have been uh, sent to the DG for approval. And once uh, this has been uh, achieved, then we will publish them in the weekly epidemiological record in a few weeks so that everybody is aware of this uh, first approval of this COVID-19 vaccine. I would leave it there, sir, and see if there are any questions that uh, somebody would like to ask. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Alejandro. <laughs> De nada, señor. <laughs> Every country needs to row in unison in the same direction to beat this pandemic. Solidarity, multilateralism, and collaboration are key so that we, will, we win the race against this pandemic quickly and escape the stormy waters together. Lastly, over the past 24 hours, members of the international scientific team on COVID-19 virus origins began traveling from their home countries to China. This was as per arrangements jointly developed between WHO, the Chinese government, and the countries for which the team was meant to travel through on their own, on their way to Wuhan. Today, we learned that Chinese officials have not yet finalized the necessary permissions for the team's arrival in China. I'm very disappointed with this news, given that two members had already begun their journeys and others were not able to travel at the last minute. But I have been in contact with senior Chinese officials, and I have once again made, made it clear that the mission is a priority for WHO and the international team. I have been assured that China is speeding up the internal procedure for the earliest possible deployment. We're eager to get the mission underway as soon as possible. I thank you, and once again, Happy New Year. Fadila, back to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tedros, and thank you, Dr. Craviotto. I will now open the floor to questions from journalists. I remind you that you need to raise your hand, use the raise your hand icon in order to get in the queue. Um, I would like now to invite our first journalist, Christine Teodoro from ABC uh, News to ask the first question. Christine, are you with us? Um, yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. The idea of delaying booster shots in order to administer an initial dose of vaccine to a larger population, given the situation in the United Kingdom, one can understand the logic in trying to provide some degree of protection to more people. But given that there's so many outstanding questions on these vaccines, uh, for instance, how long protection lasts, is there enough data to support this approach? Does a single dose compromise protection? And on the ethical considerations in using the general population to answer these outstanding questions, I wanted to get your take. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Um... Um, I would like to invite Dr. O'Brien to take this question. Uh, Dr. O'Brien, you have the floor. Thank you. This is uh, um, clearly a, an area, and I think every, everybody realizes that we're operating in a space um, uh, where the amount of evidence to drive uh, policy decisions is evidence that is evolving. Um, I think what is really important here is to recognize that um, uh, policymakers are using 
all of the evidence that is uh, in front of them. And what SAGE was deliberating on today um, was, I think, what many committees are doing, which is they are weighing the evidence that we do have about the efficacy and the immunogenicity that has derived from clinical trials where the timing of doses is, uh, is uh, um, delivered um, in a specified timing against what to do uh, around the possibility and some evidence that shows the possibility that um, single dose efficacy uh, between the timing of the first and the second dose is quite high. Um, and therefore, in a setting where there is constrained supply, um, the, the procedure, the operational procedure about how to use these vaccines um, really is weighing one risk against a second risk. So one risk is that um, we uh, are very, very scrupulous about um, applying the vaccines in the way that they were applied in the clinical trials that generated the evidence on efficacy. Um, and in doing so, we may have some limitation of the number of people who can um, receive the first dose, depending on how the supply is rolling in. And then the second risk is that if we um, allow for a broader use of vaccine as first doses, there may be some delay in getting the second dose among some people. So there, it's really a trade-off of two risks. Um, and I think what we're seeing around the world is different committees are weighing those risks and discussing those risks um, uh, in, in different ways. And so what um, perhaps Alejandro can, can um, chime in uh, um, um, with a couple of comments as well, but I think there was a very robust discussion within SAGE around the trade-off of these risks. And the, uh, and the recommendation that came out of SAGE was to allow for this um, somewhat extended interval that um, went up to a six-week period in settings where um, the concern around the epidemiology and, the, uh, and um, the, the supply, the prediction of supply. Um, but that was allowing for um, a period of time that was um, an outer limit um, in the clinical trials. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll turn over to Alejandro and see if he wants to say any more about how the committee um, was trading off those two risks. I think uh, Kate has explained it uh, as well as it should. I don't think we have anything else to add. Um, in, in a sense, I, I think we have to be a bit open to this type of, of um, decisions that countries need to make according to their own epidemiological situation. Uh, what we need in SAGE is to base our recommendations on hard evidence available to us at the time that we make our decisions. And in this sense, in general, for the use of this vaccine, we do recommend that we use two doses with a space interval of 21 to 28 days. However, a country might need to use the vaccine in a different way for many different reasons. And that is something that competes them to a local decision which goes beyond the recommendations that we're able to make at this moment. May I just add one more point? I really do want to emphasize that SAGE was deliberating um, about evidence on the Pfizer vaccine only today. Yes. Uh, this, this is a very important point. Uh, we will deliberate, SAGE will deliberate on other vaccines in other sessions in the coming uh, short number of weeks. Uh, days and weeks, um, and but what what is the the output from Sage today was only about the Pfizer vaccine. Um, thank you. Um, I would like now to invite the next uh, journalist. Um, I would like to invite Sophie Mokwena from SABC to ask the next question. Sophie, are you with us? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I just want to check, uh, in terms of the reports around the variant that was detected in South Africa, we had uh, the Minister or the Secretary of Health in the United Kingdom saying that uh, this variant is more dangerous and it's, there's a possibility that uh, uh, the vaccine will not be able to deal with this problem or the vaccine will not be effective. Have you investigated that? And the last question to 
uh, Dr. Maria Fankekov, uh, you saw the video where you were talking about uh, growing the, 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 the variant or the virus in the lab going viral in South Africa. Perhaps you'd want to clarify that. Hi, Sophie. Happy New Year. Um, thanks for both of those questions. So I'll, I'll start with the second part first. So I did address your question also on Twitter because there was some confusion about my statement about growing of the virus. This is part of the process of trying to grow the virus in a lab, in cells, not in humans, um, to have enough quantity of the virus, it's done under very controlled uh, settings, so that you have enough virus to do these experimental studies to look at the t potential impacts of you know, what this virus does and means. So it's not growing the virus in humans, uh, it's growing the virus in cells under controlled conditions. So thanks for letting me clarify that. Um, with regards to your first question of the, South, the, the variant that was identified in South Africa, um, which the South Africans have named the 501Y.V2, um, variants, and I think it is important that we name these appropriately and we don't call these the South African variant or the UK variant. We need to use the names um, appropriately because we don't want to stigmatize where these variants have been identified, um, and that's true for any virus that is identified. Um, with regards to the South African, um, uh, the variant identified in South Africa, the 501YV2, um, I did clarify that statement with the UK earlier today um, in terms of the, uh, the studies that are ongoing. Um, there's no indication that the 501YV2 um, variant has increased transmissibility, increased transmissibility compared to the UK variant. There are many studies that are underway in South Africa by South African researchers and scientists to look at the circulation of this variant, um, to look at the transmissibility, um, looking through epidemiology studies and modeling studies, as well as doing laboratory studies to look at the neutralization studies. So those are ongoing, and scientists are working very hard to understand that. Um, but there's no indication that it's more or less uh, transmissible than the variant of concern that was identified in the United Kingdom. So thanks for that question. Thank you. I would like now to invite uh, Ashley Furlong from Political to ask the next question. Ashley, are you with us? Thanks for taking my question. Um, the CEO of the Serum Institute of India um, has said that the COVAX facility probably won't receive any of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccines until March or April this year. I wanted to know if the WHO agreed with that timeline and what that meant for many countries that are part of the COVAX AMC and that are still waiting for their first doses of a vaccine. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. I would like to invite Dr. Swaminathan to take this question. Thank you. Um, so uh, the procedure for each of the vaccines as uh, they are developed um, and to be supplied would uh, be firstly going through the uh, regulatory processes uh, going through uh, a policy process, and then obviously procurement uh, distribution and, and going into vaccination programs. And um, as just like we, we just saw, the Pfizer vaccine received an emergency use listing uh, last week from the WHO. Today, there's a recommendation from SAGE, which is a policy recommendation on how this vaccine should be used. And following this, the vaccine can now be uh, procured, distributed uh, across the world in different countries, uh, including through COVAX. Um, as far as Serum Institute is concerned, the COVAX facility has, has a contract with the Serum Institute for supply of uh, both the uh, AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine as well as the Novavax vaccine. Of course, when that becomes available, it's still in phase three clinical trials. And so we expect that this will happen um, as uh, there is a contract, there is uh, already a, a deal. Uh, the Serum Institute of India is in the process of manufacturing a large number of doses. They will be supplying uh, the Indian uh, government, obviously, to start the vaccination in India. But uh, there should uh, we don't anticipate that there would be delays. Um, they are uh, submitting the dossier for uh, examination for the uh, EUA, EUL, and pre-qualification process later this week. So that's 
uh, going on under Dr. Mariangela Simao's uh, division. Um, and therefore, I think the February-March timeline is, is still very much what uh, we're looking at in terms of, of uh, being able to get that vaccine into COVAX and then distributing it out to the countries. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Swaminathan. I would like now to invite Imogen Fuchs from the BBC to ask the next question. Imogen? Hi, Fidela. Thanks for taking my question. Can you hear me all right? Very well. Uh, go ahead, Imogen. 2021. Um, it's coming back to the recommendations around the Pfizer BioNTech. Um, when you say you could extend it for six weeks, does that mean up to in six weeks total from the three to four that you recommend or six weeks on top of the three to four? And in addition, is there any risk that delaying or even abandoning the booster could promote a vaccine resistant variant? Thank you, uh, Imogen. I would like to invite Dr. Joachim Hombach, uh, SAGE Secretariat, to take this question. Joachim? Yes, uh, thank you very much for that question. So um, when we mention six weeks, this is actually the spacing between the first and the second dose. So that's exactly how it is being defined. And the six weeks, because this is the maximum time period for which at least some clinical data are available. The clinical trial was designed around 21 days, um, but there are up to 42 days, so around six weeks of, um, of data. So this is what has been uh, essentially driving the um, uh, recommendation that uh, SAGE has formulated today. Um, in relation to the emergence of virus variant, I think this is uh, speculative. Uh, we, of course, do not know um, if you administer just one dose, if there is a durable immunity, how long it lasts. Um, so there is certainly a high risk of breakthrough infections. Um, but uh, again, this, this is an area where there is very little data. Um, so we do not see a correlation with, uh, with uh, the emergence of virus variants, but obviously there would be an increased concern in relation to breakthrough, uh, breakthrough infections or vaccination failures. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Humbach. I would like now to invite Pamela Mawanda uh, from Uganda Radio. Welcome, Pamela. You have the floor. Can you please unmute yourself, Pamela, from Uganda Radio? Um, Pamela, we will come back to you later on. I would like now to invite Donato Mancini from a Financial Time to ask the next question. Donato, can you hear me? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Go ahead, Donato. Happy New Year. Um, so. Could you, could you clarify what the maximum time span is for the extended intervals? Is it six weeks? Um, because this is exactly what the EMA is recommending in limited cases, and it's also half of what the UK is doing. Um, and who are these guidelines for, and what are, the, what are the specific circumstances in which you make sort of allowance for this extended dosing regimen? Thank you, Donato. Um, I will ask again Dr. Humbach to uh, take this question. Yeah, uh, thanks very much for that question. So um, maybe I repeat myself a little bit in relation to my uh, previous answer, but the, um, the recommendation is to administer the second dose within 21 to 28 days, and this is uh, the label recommendation, and this is where the, the bulk of the clinical data have been generated. There's always some variation, and so, um, and there have been spacing in the clinical trial up to 14 two days, um, and so this is where we have been setting the boundaries. Um, the um, um, JCVI, which is the recommending body um, uh, of the UK, has um, given more flexibility up to 12 weeks um, in consideration of the specific circumstances um, that the country is currently facing, um, which uh, Dr. O'Brien explained already earlier today. 
So um, we feel that uh, we need to be grounded in evidence in relation to our recommendations, but totally acknowledge that countries may see uh, needs and um, in order to be even more flexible in terms of the administration of the second dose. But it is important to note that there is very little data that uh, underpin this empiric data from the trials that underpin this type of recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hamburg. Uh, Kate O'Brien would like to add some uh, elements. Kate, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. I, I want to add a couple of things here. Uh, and um, I, I think we have to emphasize the need for additional evidence uh, because there is no recommending body. There is no entirety of the evidence that tells us the clear and, and full answer to these uh, policy questions. And, and this is the nature of policy making, is that we must make recommendations based on imperfect data. And any particular group of people in a particular setting of epidemiology and, uh, and, and disease transmission um, are going to collectively come to uh, sometimes exactly the same uh, decision of weighing the risks and the benefits and sometimes some adjustments to those decisions um, in one particular country, another particular country, um, with different environments that they're making uh, those in. For WHO, we're making recommendations that are um, broad underpinnings for all countries around the world. And so the um, SAGE, uh, in this particular decision, uh, fully recognize that the decisions that are being made, the recommendations that are being made are interim and that we will continue to update those recommendations as more evidence accrues and we will point to the data um, that is uh, making those adjustments. So I, I really want to emphasize the need for ongoing generation of evidence and ongoing research and, and depending on what different countries do, um, that evidence will come on extended intervals or in sh on shorter intervals. The second thing I want to say is that there's nothing about this that means that if an individual has had a delay for whatever reason in getting their second dose, that they shouldn't go ahead and get it. So there's no outside limit at which point we say, you know, you, you can't get your second dose. And I, I want to be clear also on that, that any of these statements about what the interval is between the two doses never preclude somebody from getting their second dose whenever they're, whenever they're able to get it, um, even if it's a, of, of a, an even longer extended delay for whatever individual reason. So I just wanted to make those two points clear. And then the third point I want to make is that um, we are um, really looking forward to evidence from other vaccines as well. Um, both for emer emergency use listing, regulatory purposes, and for policy recommendations. And the evidence that is used for regulating a vaccine and the evidence for policy making are not always the same sets of, of evidence. Um, the policymakers do really have to um, take into consideration the actual operational on the ground, real life circumstances where practitioners, nurses, doctors, other um, types of vaccinators, uh, depending on the country, have to make a decision about an individual who's right in front of them. So we try as best we can to give clear um, recommendations that would guide an individual decision for an individual um, uh, patient. Thank you, Dr. O'Brien. I would like now to invite Emma Farge from Reuters to ask the next question. Emma? Uh, yes. Um, good afternoon. Hello. I was wondering um, about the wastage of uh, some of the Pfizer vaccines that we've been hearing about in some countries. Um, some of them, after they've been uh, cooled, have actually um, been thrown away for lack of demand. Um, how widespread is this? Um, does the WHO have a view on it? And um, what should be done to, to avoid wasting these precious vaccines? Thank you, Emma. Interesting question. Um, Dr. O'Brien? Um, we are in the very early days of, uh, for every country of rolling out vaccine. There have been 
hundreds and hundreds of vaccine introductions, in fact, thousands of vaccine introductions that have taken place around the world um, over the past five years, 10 years, uh, 20 years. The amount of attention that is being paid, of course, and, and justifiably so, to the introduction of these vaccines is like no attention that has ever been paid to vaccine introductions before. Um, the, the pace with which and the complexity of actually standing up these vaccine programs is very high. Uh, they're in age strata that we don't normally do really big, broad um, uh, rollout of vaccines. And we have you know, programs that are much more um, able and, and experienced at rolling out in infants and in teenagers. Um, we, especially with um, uh, the Pfizer vaccine with an ultra cold chain, um, uh, with the uh, supply constraints and therefore really identifying who needs to be vaccinated. So uh, I think it, it's, it's extremely important to recognize, as we've been saying, that um, getting to the efficacy results and developing these vaccines and getting to the efficacy results, I think the analogy we've used before um, that has been put out there is like building base camp at Mount Everest, but actually getting to delivery of this vaccine and all of the people who need it is the real climb to the, to the peak of Everest. So we're really in this space where um, we know that the delivery challenges are su substantial. Um, and uh, the, t the attention, the time, the training, the funding, the planning that needs to happen to operationally roll out uh, these vaccines in a way that is as highly efficient um, and is going at speed are real areas of tension. And I think we're seeing those growing pains and those learning um, roots uh, in these very early rollout countries. Um, so what is most important here is that whatever is um, happening in countries and where we're hearing about the difficulties of delivery is that we're learning from those as quickly as possible. And we're learning about what are the ways in which we can avoid um, some of these pitfalls as we move forward, and especially as we move forward in an ever broader number of countries in a very, very rapid pace. So um, we don't have a, a full handle on um, the, the quantification of the magnitude of these problems, and, of, and, and we, we very much welcome um, the transparency of countries to describe and explain um, what is going right and what's going wrong, because unless we can understand what's going wrong, it's very hard to course correct from things that you can't see, can't measure, or can't understand. Um, so I think this is, an, um, uh, I would say, unfortunately, a bit of an expected part of the challenges. But it's, uh, if, we, if we look back at what um, experts around the world in, in all countries have been saying is, nobody expected this to be easy. Um, and, uh, and I think we're, we're starting to see where some of those road bumps are um, and, and where we need to make adjustments. Thank you, Dr. O'Brien. I would like to invite Dr. Simao uh, to answer also this just, question. Just to, uh, it's an, a piece of information because as we did the emergency use listing of the Pfizer vaccine, we also uh, did uh, the emergency use listing of two syringes no, because it's a very complex vaccine. You already heard about that because of the ultra cold chain, the logistics challenges and so on. But it also needs to be, it's a 0 0.3 ml injection. So we have pre-qualified two of this 0 0.3 ml uh, syringes. So this would, will help to decrease wastage if it's happening. But I also want to say something about that we, we have a f front runner, which was the Pfizer vaccine, but we have, have other vaccines being assessed now by WHO, right? We, we have received, when we launched the expression of interest in October last year, it's already last year, we have received 15 expression of interest, 13 were uh, uh, accepted. Two of them were not accepted because they were not yet on phase 2B or phase 3. And since then, we did uh, list the Pfizer vaccine. We have two other dossiers rolling, being assessed as we speak, and we are expecting three additional dossiers from other vaccine producers during the month of January. So we, we, we have in our hands right now a limited a number of a, of a complex vaccine with a high efficacy, 
right? But we will have more vaccines coming up uh, in the months of February being, uh, and March this year. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Yeah, just maybe to add from, from an operations point of view, and I very much agree with what Kate, Kate said, but we, right, right around the world, we have already stressed understaffed and underfunded public health, primary health care, immunization services who've been on the front line for the last year trying to deal with surveillance and testing and contact tracing and quarantine. These same frontline public health services now have to absorb the, 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 the job of doing the vaccination as well as part of the broader public health service. Uh, this requires, you know, generating, managing and sustaining demand, scheduling, micro planning, uh, the logistics of moving the vaccine around, making sure the vaccine reaches the person on the right day at the right time in the right place. This is a complex process. It is resource intensive, both human and, and physical and financial resource in, intensive. It's really important that national governments who are issuing vaccines and distributing vaccines to subnational level are also aware of the investments that are needed to shore up the capacity of the system to deliver those vaccines at the local level. You can't file and forget. You can't dispatch and, and, and forget. You have to drive and follow each vaccine right into the arm of the person who has to get it. We've learned that in polio. I'm looking across here at Bruce uh, and many other measles and other diseases. And you've got to follow that chain of quality and efficiency, as Kate said, right the way down through that chain uh, in, in, in the system. And quite frankly, and many countries uh, have, uh, may have been overconfident in their ability to do that and have made some assumptions about their capacities that may not have existed. WHO is working very closely, and Kate may, or, or, or uh, Joachim or others may come in on this, working very closely with, uh, with 100 countries now on their micro planning. Because as part of COVAX, one of the requirements of being part of COVAX is to work on that very process of delivering the vaccine, enabling successful vaccination. That's why COVAX initiative isn't just about getting vaccines. It's about delivering vaccines and de delivering them to the people who most need them in an equitable fashion, but most importantly, efficiently with the lowest possible wastage. So all countries really need to take a hard look at their capacity to deliver vaccines. It, always at the beginning, as, 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 as Kate says, we always falter at times at the beginning of a new procedure in public health. We always make some errors. The question is not making the errors. The issue is not learning from those errors and not extrapolating from those errors and realizing that our systems are probably not strong enough right now to deliver this vaccine as efficiently as we would like and we need to invest. And WHO is doing that with our partners in COVAX, with our partners in immunization programs around the world. But those immunization programs need the resources, they need the support, they need the man and woman power to do this. Thank you. Dr. Edward. A quick point on the last part of the question that was asked was about how do you avoid wastage, right? And the single best thing we can do is the planning right yes. up front. And Mike was alluding that a little bit, and, and uh, Kate isn't uh, uh, blowing her own horn on this, but the WHO and UNICEF teams with the others have done a fabulous job of putting together guidance for countries on the complex process of national vaccine deployment plans. And there's been an aggressive program of work going on since the middle of November to help every one of the countries in the world with the weakest systems to be able to identify and address the obstacles and blockages they might have right now. Because, you know, the motto that's uh, sort of quietly behind the whole role out of the, uh, of, of the vaccine is no dose lays idle. That, that's the motto everybody's working toward. So um, the single most important part of it has been that advanced planning, capacity building, training, et cetera, everything that Mike referred to, um, and which has been a huge intensive part of, uh, of the rollout work already, even before the vaccines hit the ground. Some countries, as you may have heard in the press, are already, uh, people are reporting on the um, uh, simulation exercises they're doing to make sure that they aren't wasting those doses and they're getting those into people as rapidly as possible because quite frankly, these are gonna save lives if they get to the people who are most vulnerable and most high risk of dying, if we can get them into them now. And then this comes back to the point the Director General is making. We have a lot of countries, including
increasingly ready. We need the vaccines to be able to get these into those people. And that's why we went out with a donation policy from the COVAX facility two weeks ago, so that countries with many doses and access to many doses could provide those to some of the most vulnerable countries that need them. And as well, we're, why we're trying to fast track the deals that are still outstanding with manufacturers to try and make sure we have the products we need to take advantage of the uh, readiness work that's been done. Thank you all. I would like now to invite uh, IFP Robin Miller to ask the next question. Robin, can you hear me? No. Robin, can you hear me? If not, Agnes from IFP. I think uh, I would like now to, Agnes, can you hear me? I can yes, see... I can hear you. Do you hear me? Yes, fine. Go ahead. We have yes. two AFP reporters with us today. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, I have a question concerning um, what Dr. Tedros said on the, the mission uh, on the exports uh, going to, to China. Uh, something is not clear for me. You say that uh, some experts already began to go to travel, uh, so they are uh, en route, as we say in French. Uh, but at the same time, you say you don't have the um, full uh, authorizations. So I was wondering, where are those uh, experts now? Thank you, Agnes. Um, Dr. Ryan will take uh, this question. Yes, we, we, we were, uh, have been working on very close planning with, the, with colleagues in China and other countries for the, the, the dispatch of the team, and we were all operating on the understanding that the team would begin deployment uh, today. Uh, uh, two of the team had, uh, because they're coming from far away and through difficult journeys, had begun their journey previous, uh, very early uh, today, and had begun their journeys. Uh, and, uh, but in the meantime, it became clear that the necessary approvals uh, had not been uh, 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 gotten, uh, particularly it was in specifically in regards to visa clearances. And uh, we did not want to uh, uh, put people in the air unnecessarily if there wasn't a guarantee of their arrival in China being successful. Uh, in that regard, Dr. Tedros has taken immediate action and has spoken with senior Chinese officials and has fully impressed uh, upon them the absolute critical nature of this. We, we trust and we hope that this is just a logistic and, 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 and bureaucratic issue that can be resolved very quickly and, and, and Dr. Tedros expects that that will be the case and has emphasized the absolute need for this. The two colleagues uh, who have been traveling have been, uh, one has been turned around and as a reasonably short journey home, uh, the other will stay in transit in a, in a third country. Uh, uh, awaiting uh, further uh, in, uh, inputs from us. Uh, and we would like to thank our experts for uh, further flexibility in this. Many of them have carved out very precious time from their home institutions, and we thank their home institutions for this. Uh, this is uh, frustrating, and as the Director General has said, this is disappointing. That disappointment has been expressed very clearly by Dr. Tedros directly to our counterparts in, in China. And uh, we trust that in good faith we can solve these uh, issues in the, in the coming hours and recommence the deployment of the team uh, as urgently as possible. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Ryan. We, we have gone over one hour since we started this press conference, so uh, I would like to invite Dr. Tedros for final comments. Over to you, uh, Dr. Tedros. No, oh, thank you. Thank you, Fadila, and thank you all uh, who have joined today. I think some of you have complained about uh, a delay in our, uh, you know, starting the uh, presser. So apologies uh, for that. Uh, we will improve. But thank you for uh, joining, uh, and uh, Happy New Year again, and see you in our upcoming Thank you, Dr. Tedros uh, and Dr. Cravioto and colleagues for your participation. We will be sending the audio file um, and DJ remarks just after this press conference. The full transcript will be available tomorrow on the WHO website. 
if you have any follow-up question, please do send an email to mediainquiries at who.int. The press briefing is now closed. Thank you.